Um, we have up next a scientist, a researcher, and an Erlang expert. He has worked together with Joe Armstrong, the inventor of Erlang. That's quite cool, guys, right? Come on. <laughs> uh, you should be impressed. Come on. Um, yeah, he has uh, more than 20 years' experience in programming on Erlang. And today we'll be talking about the security review of the components of Eternity. So, Thomas Hartz, please. Thank you very much. So, I was Around having. Of applause, guys. Come oh on. Oh, yeah. Fine. Come on. I was having dinner the other night with one of my colleagues from the core team asking me, when did you start with Erlang? And I said, the year. And he said, oh, I was born in that year. So that, that gives you a kind of perspective. And I feel a bit old at that moment, but also a bit proud that I've been in the right field for so long already. So that's nice. Um, yeah, so my parents said when I wanted to study computer science, yeah, but also do a kind of a serious uh, education as well, because computer science, you know, you're probably never going to to get a job with that. So I also did mathematics at the same time uh, in order to be job secure. And then I started a PhD in a very theoretical subject, but I was really drawn to, to functional languages because I believe that the only way we can solve this, this problem with all the software errors is to use functional languages because then you can prove things about your program and you can show that it is correct and people were still using weird languages like C or Java and things like that, which, which you didn't really get a grasp on, on quality. So quality has always driven me, and quality was the thing I, I went to Ericsson for. I worked there in the computer science laboratory to help kind of prove properties of the software which went into the switches, because if telephone switches fail, then that's very expensive and annoying. Uh, later on, when I moved to another part of Sweden, Gothenburg, where I became professor at Chalmers, uh, with the same idea of, of helping people to learn functional languages and teach them about quality. And then I started up having my own company doing quality. So that's, that's my, my background a little bit. I'm not a security expert at all. So I don't basically not know much about security. Still, I, I was asked to do something about security and I did, did something cool, so I thought let's just, just explain that to you, what we did. So this is joint work with uh, Hans, which you saw before. Uh, he did the e-noise implementation, and we'll talk a bit about e-noise, or noise uh, protocol. It's also joint work with some researchers. So there was a, a research team that invited me to be in a workshop, and the guy, uh, Santiago Sanella Burgeni, is from Microsoft Research. And then there's Martin Mori from Paderborn University, and then the two researchers from the University of Politecnica in Madrid. And we, we like working together. So we were in that workshop, and, and Lajok and Clara came later to Sweden to, to work with me on trying to find out how can we help in security. So I will briefly go over this. So security is about finding vulnerabilities in your software. And vulnerabilities are typically software faults that might be exploited by an attacker to gain access to your assets, right? They, they, an asset can be your, your crypto key, or an asset can be your, your tokens, or an asset can be kind of the, the computation time, or your contract, or whatever. So that kind of things you want to, to, to find. Is there something in the code that they might be able to use? You don't know whether they use it or not, but might be able. So that's what we wanted to do. Uh, so most of the vulnerabilities, you, of course, think of when you're designing your, your system. You think of what can people do uh, when, they, when they get access to my software. And you try to make this design in such a way that you prevent them from uh, being vulnerable. So your design is already kind of covering most of the stuff. And then the rest of the vulnerabilities, in our case, is normally found during testing. So we start testing and then if you did not follow that idea of how you protect your vulnerabilities and you do very good testing, then you will find those vulnerabilities in the code because they show up as bugs in your test cases. So uh, then, of course, whether or not such a, a bug that you find or an error that you find in testing is actually exploitable, that's something we don't really know. But the standard point, uh, the viewpoint that we have is if you have a bug in your software, it might be exploited, therefore better fix it immediately. Right? Uh, and then, this talk is not about that testing part, uh, I will mention probably, but it's more about the analysis that you can do that goes beyond testing. And we did a little bit of that in this particular case. So there are different techniques that you can use, and I will talk about that. So, 
the noise protocol is a communication protocol based on Diffie-Hellman key exchange. And it's a bit like, for those of you that don't know noise and you don't have to have many details, but if you open your browser, you see this green thingy there, this lock, that's TLS, that's the, the way of HTTPS communication with your server. Noise is kind of a slimmed down and better version of that TLS protocol, right? So people can talk to each other securely without a man-in-the-middle attack, and that's, that's what noise implements. In, in a kind of very abstract, uh, simple, simplistic way. So we use noise for communication between the eternity nodes. So if two eternity nodes talk to each other, or two of the nodes, full nodes, talk to each other, then they use um, noise to gossip blocks, to gossip transactions, uh, and even in the state channels to talk with the other party and the state, state machine, FSM. So that's, that's what's all happening with noise. Now, of course, if you have such a crypto uh, protocol, you want to know that that crypto protocol is a kind of secure, that the implementation is, is good enough, so to say. So what we did then is we looked at, okay, what, what are the components that we have to look at? So we run the system on a Linux operating system, and Linux is, well, there might be bugs in Linux, but that's not our concern to find them, right? We, we trust Linux enough to say, well, that's okay. And even if it's not okay, probably the next layers will cover the things that are not okay in the, on the Linux level. So that's not our concern. But what is of our concern is the next level. It's a Lipsodium crypto library. So in order to implement noise, you need some cryptographic primitives. Cryptographic primitives are typically implemented in C because they are computational intensive. So that C library that we use should better work very nicely. On top of that, we have something which is called eNuckle. And eNuckle is just the binding of the C library to Erlang. So somehow Erlang has access to the C library. That's the eNuckle uh, slide over there. So eNackle better has to be secure, because if eNackle screws up, then we are screwed. And then there's the noise implementation, which uses eNackle to use the crypto primitives to encode and decode whatever it has to be encoded. Now, noise is absolutely 100% secure, of course, because Hans Svensson wrote that. So that, that's fine, that we know that. But you still want to have a kind of an analysis which goes a bit deeper to say why, what, what is going on there. And then, of course, there's the eternity uh, node itself, and you can wonder how do we show that, that noise is used in the right way in the eternity node. So I just give you a glimpse of what we did in this, uh, in this analysis. So there are very good C static analyz analyzers at the moment. So if you want to look at Lipsodium, the first thing, of course, is you, you try to use a static analyzer to, to just go over the code and warn you if there are any security vulnerabilities potential in that code. So this is, this is going, who of you do know C as a language and has worked with C? Uh, only a few, but, but there is something called Linter, and Linter warns you for extra errors that you may have made in your code, which are not kind of the typical compilation errors. It will compile, it will be fine, but it will warn you for those kind of things. That has expanded also in the security area to analyzers which say, hey, here you might actually have a security bug, but please have a better look at it. So what we did is we, we took the, the basic standard CLang static analy analyzer, which you can download and run, and we run that over the C code with lots of flags, so lots of kind of check this, check that, check that, and then see what will happen. Uh, pointer arithmetic, do you do something strange there? Warn me if something happens. And if that all would be green, then you would say, well, that's really well written software in the sense of uh, security. We run that, we got 17 issues. Oh, that's not too bad, it's, it's a lot of C code, so it's 17, but it still is 17 issues. So each of those issues is a potential Vulnerability. It need not be a vulnerability because we don't know yet, but it's a potential vulnerability. You have to look into that. And that's some manual effort at the moment. So you, you would really have to go and analyze that kind of thing. So let me give you one example uh, quickly. So this is what the static analysis can come to. Do you have a pointer for me? A laser pointer? Um, no, I don't. No? Okay, then I just walk here and point it. 
So we get this on the bottom line, pointer arithmetic on non-array variable relies on memory layout, which is dangerous. That's the message that is spot out by this warning system. And you think, ah, oh, right, indeed. Because I do a DST, that's the destination, is a pointer which is a plus plus with something, and yeah, probably that's unsafe, probably. So you, know, you have to reason your way on why this is an okay thing to do. And you can do that by just looking and staring at the code and sitting an afternoon and say, yeah, okay, this is fine. Oh, just that one, okay, thank you. So this is where I was pointing at, at this, this point of operation. And then you see a little bit that, that this n log 2 variable should be inbound for this static uh, array of characters. So some, some of the characters has to be, be chosen and should not be out of bound and then everything is fine. So you can reason yourself to that but reasoning is error prone because m people make mistakes. So you could also try to do that in a more automatic way by using a model checker. Model checkers are typically tools that instead of testing one particular value in your code, test for all the possible values in your code if you, if you want to see it like that. So you, you just say, for any value I can give this program, does it work? And you have to instrument that a little bit and that's still a bit too manual in my uh, for my feeling, but you can tell the model checker to say, yes, this can never happen. So we did that, uh, we put them in a model checker, we run all those 17 issues that, well, some of them were not model checkable, but others were. We said, well, let's see if we actually can get to that point which is dangerous. And if so, then we have a problem. Now, luckily for us, none of those 17 issues was actually a vulnerability. Right? So they all were okay after further analysis. But remember that this is, a, this is a software project which will live for, say, 100 years, right? Because if we have a reasonable success, then we will be around in 100 years' time. And in 100 years' time, we will not have Lipsodium running in, as it is now. We will have different libraries. And every time the library is updated, we will have to redo this analysis. And that's a bit, ah, it feels a bit, time wasting, so you would really like to automate that. So one of the things is, could we not just rewrite that C code in such a way that we do not get the issues? Because then we could just run the static analysis, there's no issues, just, okay, fine, continue. This is fine, let's do that. But C code, you know, this might have been done for a very good reason. People may have thought about those lines of C code and on purpose do this because, for example, it's C programmers are smart guys, they might actually like constant time operations. So you might, might change the C code and then you break something that they have in mind should work, right? So you have to be very careful to, to do that kind of things. But then I, I, I doubt a little bit about all this because, so assume you want to write C code for constant time operations. You write your operation such a way that when you measure, the time is always the same, no matter if you encrypted the right key or the wrong key, right? That's the, the normally a use of constant time operation. So are the programmers really aware of, the comp of what they are doing? And there was a research article uh, presenting that, well, probably not, because depending on the version of the compiler, and of course the flags that you're using in the compiler, you may or may not have constant time operation for source code, which is typically written as this is constant time operation. So it's not necessarily sure that the programmers writing this know which compiler we are going to use in order to get constant time operation. So it's a bit risky to do that. And that's where Microsoft Research came in. They had an implementation of Lipsodium, this, the C library, which was formally verified. Now, formal verification is kind of my pet project, my, my, my kind of research interest. You make a mathematical model of your software and you prove it's correct. Fantastic, then you know it will work, right? So, and that was done for this library. So this is, this is super, you want to use that library. So what did we do? Well, we put, uh, this, is, this is what we use in uh, Lipsodium. So if you have Enacl here in Erlang, then Enacl calls Lipsodium, and these are the decryptive prim primitives that we call from eNoise to Enacle to Lipsodium. So those are the functions that we need for our implementation, and these are then implemented in Lipsodium. We thought, well, let's replace them by Lipsodium by this formally verified C library. 
But we could not really do that because there was one function, generic hash, which was not implemented in HECL, star. Right? That's how they call their library. Well, you think, then just implement that. No. If you implement something in a formally verified language, you don't just implement it. You have to mathematically prove that your implementation is correct. So that would take more than a day. So we thought, no, no, just take everything here from that library, and the generic hash, we take the old library, and just see if it works. And if it works, we have made one step forward, and then Microsoft Research can implement generic hashes, and then we, we talk again, and we will use their implementation. Fantastic. So we don't know yet, it's formally verified, we don't know yet if we have any issues. So let's, let's check that first on this Hackle uh, library. So Lipsodium had 17 issues. Let's do the same analysis. Ah, we got four issues. There's still four too many. Quick, quickly looking at those issues, it was all false positive because there was an amount of dead code. It warned about, this is dead code. You're never going to call this. It was not very hard to take that code away. Uh, it was even very simple to do that, still having the formal proof of correctness in place. So we could got that done in a day, and then it was, was kind of issue-free. Nice, we have an issue-free piece of source code which is formally verified, mathematically correct, let's use it. Well, we learned in this business. The ma fact that something is formally verified and mathematically correct doesn't mean it passes all the tests. So let's test it as well. This might sound strange to you, and I can explain that in many hours of lectures, but it happens that even if you formally verify something, it doesn't pass the test, and that's very important as well. So, in, in our project, we use a tool called QuickCheck. That's, that's our kind of test case generation tool, right? So, you normally write your test case by hand. You say, this and this should happen. We generate tests automatically for mathematical specifications. We like doing these kind of things. So, basically, what we did is we, we did that already for eNuckle, because eNuckle is, is well tested with quick check for all kind of properties. So all kind of things are, are tested with this automatic test generation tool. So that's nice, we just take such a property, it says for all the keys and the messages and things like that, if you encrypt it and you decrypt it, then you should get the same thing back. That's typically the specification and then a quick check will generate m millions of tests if you, if you want to, to, to verify that claim. Let's do this, but now we call, still call Enacle, but Lipsodium is replaced by EHCL. What do you expect? I did not expect this, but there was an issue. And this is actually the fix of that issue. And the issue was that in the glue code, because they had written this, this Huckle library and not 100% compatible in the function names and things like that with the Lipsodium library. And in order to make it compatible, in order to make it the same function names which you can call, they did a little bit of translation in that wrapper. And that wrapper was not formally verified. Can you imagine? It's very little code, so it will be correct, because little pieces of code are always correct, right? No. And it was not just a little error here, it was a Super error, right? Because what did they do? You can see it here. So they say, if the result is true, then do this. If it is false, then do that. Then return, return true or return false. In mathematics, true is one, false is zero. In C, zero means true. Any other value is false. So basically, if you would ask this formally verified crypto library, Oh, here's a key, here's a message. Did this key sign this message? It will say, yes, meaning no. <laughs> so far, so good. We ditched the idea of using this library at this moment in time in eternity. Let them mature a little bit and then we can revisit this. It's, it's a nice thing, but not really there yet. And then we kept Lipsodium and we looked at Enuckle a little bit more carefully. We used the same C analysis, we found only one thingy, and that is that in this, in this function, you increase a pointer, and you put X in it, and then you shift X eight bytes 
because you just copy and paste this. But this shift is not really necessary because you're not going to do anything with X afterwards. So it says, ah, you could probably better take that code away. We took the code away. It is fine. It works, right? So that was the only thing we, we got there. And then we said, well, let's do some kind of code review, manually look in the code, see if we have any memory exploits in the code. I'm not going to go into detail, but basically, airline calls this stuff, and this stuff then does a memory copy, so it copies some of the memory, but it also, uh, at the end, returns the memory. And there's not, not really something going on. The only thing there is that we realize that, hey, here you zero out the memory. You do that often in cryptography, right? You, you, whenever your key is not used anymore, you just write zeros over that memory, such that no one else that happens to pick up that memory is going to, to see these numbers. And I realized at that moment that with an Erlang, you still have the key in memory, because you, you basically copy the stuff, and it's still in the Erlang memory. So how would that work? Well, Erlang, you cannot just have random memory access, so that's fine. The garbage collector will take it away at the end. But until the garbage collector takes it away, and until it then is overwritten by something else, the key is in memory. That's not very good. So then I remembered, oh well, I remembered that many times, but Ulf Wieger told me once about some guys in black suits entering the Ericsson office and demanding that whenever you wiretap an airline system, you're not allowed to notice that it's wiretapped. You know, legislation. Companies don't like it if the telecom operator knows that someone in the black suit is wiretapping your telephone line. And I happen to know, and we happen to know when we turn to him, that this, this could be done. You could make sure that no one could wiretap you. So we made sure no one could look at this cryptic key while you were in operation. So that, that works fine as well. Okay, a bit faster. Then we looked at eNoise, and eNoise is, is then the Erlang implementation of the noise protocol. That's the thing we really are interested in to see if it's correct. So Lipsodium is, is correct. After the analysis, eNACL was kind of a no-brainer, it was very good, it's just a, the link. And now we have to look at eNoise. First of all, we, there's a formally verified crypto analysis or a security analysis over the number of uh, the patterns in eNoise. So eNoise has a lot of communication patterns. So if you talk to someone, you decide what pattern to talk. And in eternity, it was chosen to use the XK pattern. It's one of the 20 patterns that you have, the XK pattern. And then we analyze that XK pattern, says, is it, is it secure to do this? And it's fine as long as so you s this is a secret key from, from the other one, typically one of our, our nodes, and then someone is going to talk to us, and we, we exchange some keys, and then it's okay for this guy that connects to our nodes if they wait for a message from us before they start talking to us. And I think that's, that's just implemented in this way, because you always get your first genesis block, and then you start talking. So this, this works fine. So we made the right choice, with respect to the pattern that we use. Uh, Sasha pointed this in the right direction, and we, we could then start to gain some more trust. So how do you can gain trust in security protocols? Uh, you test against the reference factor, you test against another implementation, of course we did that, and that worked all perfectly fine. So if you test against another implementation, you get anything wrong, then your crypto will be different, and if your crypto is slightly different, you will just not be able to talk to the other node. So the crypto part was, is, of course, completely correct in that sense. But the crypto doesn't necessarily, or the tests don't necessarily detect whether you are actually doing the XK protocol, although that's pretty obvious from the test cases, but you might also do other things, which the test does not notice. You might also, in a side channel, send away the key to something else or whatever, right? You, you might implement that. And then the question is, how do you find out? Well, not by testing. So this is about what else can we do. Uh, and then we can do code inspection, uh, normally done by, by people looking at the code. And you look for certain security flaws. When we did that, uh, we could immediately see that, well, if you look at the code, it's almost following the specification directly. It's Erlang, high level, you put the specification here, you put the code there, and you can almost see one-to-one -one that, yeah, this is following the right, the right approach. That's fine. Uh, and then, but 
then you have to manually do this. And whenever you would make a change in the implementation, which has not happened, I mean, there have been three changes since we, we launched it, and they, they have nothing to do with this stuff. So when you would look at that, you would probably have to redo and redo this manual effort. And I wondered, can we do that automatically? And there are two, two ways that you can do that. One is taint analysis, where you say, this is a dangerous operation, and then you follow it back to the origin, or you, you follow what happens with the key, and then you color everything red until it is safe to actually, uh, safe enough to, to see on the other side. And the taint analysis is something that might not help here. So I tried it by hand, and said, no, everything is tainted, and then you learn very little of it. So taint analysis was probably not the right technique to use here. So we came up with something new, and we published that at the Erlang workshop this year, and that is provenance analysis. So we make an Erlang trace of everything which happens, and we recognize the keys and say, how are the keys constructed, and what are people doing with those keys? And from there, we learned whether there is any side channel or anything kicking out of the security protocol. And guess what? It was all perfectly in order. So, but now it's automatable. Now we can automatically do the code review, which is kind of nice. I recommend you reading this article if you're more interested or talk to me uh, about that. Last thing you have to do then is to look into eternity peer-to-peer -peer, uh, in, in the real kind of protocol uh, in eternity level. And we did that manually once and you all did that several times because you're very concerned about your tokens on the chain and it's open source. So I imagine that you read the code every day and see that there are no changes, right? So we don't really have to do that because you, you're already doing that. No, just kidding. But this, this is still a manual process to see are we using the things in the right way. Concluding, it's pretty tedious to analyze security, but there are good tools at the moment to help you. And if they are not there, it's a good thing to develop them further such that you get some more security automatically because that's what you really want. If it is not automatic, you're not going to do it. And if you're not going to do it, security vulnerabilities will get into your code. But that said, the errors in the vulnerabilities we have found so far have mainly been found by very exhaustive testing. Right? So we, we test a hell of it and we find things and then we say, oops, this was probably not a good thing to do, and then we try to get it right. So testing has saved us for the moment for a lot of things which have not even been found by those analysis tools. So I think we should continue doing that as well as developing the analysis tools further. And noise, as I said before, is used for node-to-node -node communication and inside state channels. And that's it for me. Right. Um, one, 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 one. Le le let's have a couple of questions. Um, who wants to ask a question? Yep. I like your questions. They're short. Um, how do you think our formal verification uh, compares with uh, Cardano and they always advertise themselves as being formally verified and all that? So Cardano has an extremely good team in formal verifying uh, engineers that can verify, formally verify their, their algorithms. And as I think that gives, in the long run, a very, very cool ground on the algorithms they use. It makes you less flexible in how quick you can move in the space, because if you want to change something, it takes a real, real long time to update that. Uh, and it may be that some things are relatively slipping through because, you, well, one or two lines of code you don't really have to verify. It's just glue code, right? So you, you don't have to do it. And then you may still have a vulnerability. I don't know exactly how they address it, but I think it has pros and cons to do that. But I believe that in the long run, when you talk about something which has a lot of value and has a lot of value to protect, formal analysis is unavoidable. We have to do it, basically. Because otherwise we will not be safe in the long run. Any more? I have a question then. Uh, are you familiar with Stella Slingshot? With? Stella Slingshot, the, what they write in, uh, in, well, it's kind of, sh should be a ZKVM eventually, but... Uh, no, I'm not you, All right, I was wondering what you think about that. No, but I, I, I don't, I don't know. Okay, it. never mind. Anyone else? Come on, you don't like cryptographical questions? <laughs> 
in fact, I was wondering like to talk about that a little bit later with you. Uh, so there is a lot of tons of stuff for the automatic verification done in Coq. Uh, are you using it? Are you planning to use it? Uh, does it work well with Erlang? Uh, Coq is, is, is a theorem prover where you can prove theorems about software. Um, we are not using it in combination with Erlang. Um, it is it's difficult to, well, it can be done, but it's very time consuming. Once upon a time, I worked on a theorem proof of four Erlang directly, which was, was more successful in that sense because you really have a direct connection to the code. But it turned out we learned that using such a theorem prover is a really difficult task. You need a PhD at least to, to do that. And we have people with PhDs, so it's not a big deal. <laughs> but keeping up with the development speed is very, very difficult then. So you can only do it for pieces of software which are very, very critical and which are not going to be changed every week. Right? Like we try to be very agile and, and change things quickly. So you have to pick your things carefully and then you can do formal verification with theorem provers, not necessarily with COC, there are others as well, but, but something like that could definitely be used to, to prove certain components to be more secure than they are today. Or Well, they are probably secure, but you haven't we don't have the proof of it. That's the thing. Are there any hacks on Erlang virtual machine? Which so normally Erlang is, um, doesn't allow uh, modifications, yes, mutations. Are there any hacks which uh, can go around it and like destroy uh, some uh, uh, assumptions? Are there any hacks that on the on the Erlang virtual machine in which you could compromise assets? That's the the question, right? Yes. Um, I'm sure there are in the sense that it's, it's a very big system, uh, but you are pretty much rescued by the fact that you decide which Erlang you run on your node, and no one else can be on the node itself. And, and Erlang does not communicate with the outside world unless you tell it to, tell, uh, to talk to the outside world via some other protocols than the ones you have chosen. So our nodes that we built will only talk over noise and not in, well, probably also some HTTP channels, but they will normally not be directly accessible. So you cannot reach the VM in any way other than via the protocols, and then it's safe. Yeah, my, my question was rather related to like the code itself. So in the code, if you can uh, go around uh, like the principle of the virtual machine and do a modification, mutation. If you get your PR uh, in to and then the whole next release, the, then, then, the then whole you, proof could, will not you could work do anymore. It. Yes, yes, yeah, right. Yeah. The, there are always that kind of scenarios possible where you change your Linux system or you change the Erlang uh, distribution, whatsoever. But but that's not the most likely one. But it absolutely can happen. Yes. You have to combine. Thanks. Uh, one more. So we've got a question about side channel attacks because uh, when you formerly very when you tested Lipsodium, you only looked at the overall crypto functionality. So you tested that uh, the crypto applies to the to the crypto specifications, and you checked that uh, it works overall. But have you looked into testing uh, whether there are side channel leaks? Yeah, because and then you then can. For this community, let's, let's say side channels have nothing to do with state channels and things like that. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's just, is your C program leaking information into some other thing which you can use later on? That's, that's your question, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So, no, we did not look at that for uh, Lipsodium, and that's why I was so interested in Huckle, because that had that formal proof that it would not leak any information. Right? Mm -hmm. So it would have been nice to be able to l use that straight off because then you would know, okay, that, that part is fine. But it comes with a certain cost, and in this case the cost was it's not mature enough to use. And we didn't even use look at performance because I thought the maturity is the first thing to look at. Mm -hmm. uh, this was one and a half year ago. It might be much better now, so we might reconsider. But at that time, it, it was like that. So, no, we have not looked at side channel attacks for specifically lip sodium. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Round of applause. Thank you.